So a while back, I posted a video about Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571. If you didn't see that video or don't remember it, the plane crashed in the Andes Mountains in the 1970s, and the survivors ended up eating the flesh of the dead passengers in order to survive long enough to be rescued. That story is pretty dark, but the men in that scenario only resorted to cannibalism because their lives were at stake. What's even darker is those who engage in cannibalism just because they seem to want to. Let's talk about a bizarre legend out of Scotland that you may have heard about already, but I still had to talk about. This is the legend of Sonny Bean. So just to start out, there is a lot of information out there about Sonny Bean, both on and offline. From my research, I'd say a about a fourth of it is from verified, reliable sources. The rest is unverified at best. And as we'll see later, there's plenty of debate as to whether the story actually even happened. So keep that in mind as we go. But here's the story. Alexander Sawney Bean was born in the county of East Lothian, not too far from the capital city of Edinburgh in Scotland. According to an early version of the story, he was born in the reign of Queen Elizabeth, who ruled England from 1558 to 1603. I know it might seem weird to reference a Queen of England in a story that takes place in Scotland before the formation of the United Kingdom, but more on that history later. Most sources said Sawney's parents were hedgers and ditchers, a career that basically involved building fences. Another source said they were tanners. But whatever they did, Sawney wanted no part of it, having no desire at all to make an honest living. He eventually left home and headed for South Ayrshire in southwest Scotland. Somewhere along the way, he met the woman who would become his wife, though it's not clear how they met or if they were ever legally married. The woman has been called Agnes Douglas or Black Agnes and was rumored to be a witch. The couple settled in a cave called Benane Cave in Galloway. They lived there for the next 25 years, not interacting with anyone from the outside world, except their victims. Over the years, Sonny and Agnes had 14 children and 32 grandchildren. Since they didn't interact with the outside world, at least not to the extent necessary to conceive a child, you can use your imagination to figure out how the grandchildren came about. But with all these people living in a cave, they needed a way to support themselves and not by making an honest living, that would be crazy. Instead, the family took advantage of anyone who came across their cave, robbing and killing them. Men, women, children, it didn't matter. Anyone who crossed paths with them was never seen again. After they were dead, the family would eat their flesh. What parts of the body they didn't eat were thrown into the sea, their limbs often washing up in other cities in the country. Another source said they would salt and pickle the leftovers and then throw what was remaining out to sea. With all these people going missing and limbs washing up on shore, people naturally started to talk. They didn't know what was going on, but they were scared. People stopped traveling altogether in the area of the cave if they didn't have to. Spies were sometimes sent out, but they never returned. Many innkeepers and travelers were also suspected in the disappearances. Travelers were suspected because they could easily go from place to place without being detected, and innkeepers because they were associated with travelers. A lot of innkeepers quit their jobs so they wouldn't look suspicious, and many of these suspects were ultimately hanged for their crimes. After word got out, the beans were more careful. They wouldn't attack large groups of people if they were on horseback because they had to take extra care to make sure none of them escaped, which I assume would be more difficult on horseback. But the Bean family was huge, and it probably wasn't as hard to take down groups of people on foot. People who did make it out of the area unscathed never saw anything or suspected anything out of the ordinary, because they always went out when the tide was high, and this hit the entrance to the cave. The Bean's victim count is unknown, but it's thought to be at least a thousand. One day, a husband and wife were returning home after spending the day at a local fair. Unfortunately for them, their route took them by the Bean's cave. They were attacked, and the wife was killed immediately, being dragged off the back of the horse and the Bean family feeding on her corpse like zombies. 
right in front of her husband. The husband did manage to fight back, partially fueled by the idea that he would suffer the same fate as his wife if he didn't get away. But he was in luck that day. He didn't have to fight long before a group of 20 or 30 people who had also spent the day at the fair came by. Between all of them, they managed to drive the Bean family away. The man explained to the group what had happened and showed them his wife, or what was left of her. He reported the incident to the provost of nearby Belasco. A provost is basically the equivalent of a mayor. The provost, in turn, reported it to King James I. The king visited the area a few days later with the surviving husband, bloodhounds, and a group of about 400 of his men. But despite the group's size, none of them could find the cave right away. The bloodhounds eventually did find it and stood by the entrance, barking furiously. At first, the king didn't think anyone could possibly be in the cave because it was so dark, but the bloodhounds kept barking, so he eventually went in. Finally, the king and his men reached the area of the cave where the family lived. They were shocked to find limbs hanging up in rows like dried beef. Piles of money also lay around the cave, though I'm not sure what use the Bean family would have had for them. The entire family, as well as all the possessions the king's men could carry, were seized and taken back to Edinburgh. The family was taken to a toll booth, a building that housed things like council meeting chambers, courthouses, and jails. The Beans were all executed the next day without a trial because it was believed to be Needless to try creatures who were even professed enemies to mankind. And their punishment was almost as brutal as their crimes. The men had their limbs sawed off and bled to death within a few hours. The women and grandchildren were forced to watch this. Then they were burned alive. Despite this torment, they all died without the least signs of repentance. There were a few sources that said either one of Sawney's daughters or granddaughters escaped to a town called Girvan in South Ayrshire. When the townspeople found out who she was, she was hanged from a tree she'd planted, known as the Harry Tree. So before we move on, there is something that I want to address. There is confusion as to exactly who the king was in this story. Sawney Bean was said to have lived in the 1600s when James I was king of Scotland. Some people think the James I the story is referring to is one who died in 1497 over a hundred years earlier. This would obviously create doubt in the story, but I don't think that's the case. Let me explain. James VI was born in 1566 in Edinburgh. He became king the very next year after the death of his father, Lord Darnley. By the way, side note, James's mother was the famous Mary Queen of Scots. As he grew older, James also wanted to establish his claim to the throne of England. So he formed an alliance with Elizabeth I, who ruled England at the time. When she died childless in 1603, he also became king of England. After this, he was known as... James I. Another side note, he's also responsible for the commissioning of the King James translation of the Bible. So most sources actually say that James VI slash James I, who were the same person, was actually the king featured in the story. And I will call him James I from here on out just for clarity. So in my opinion, the information on King James I in the story lines up. However, there are many indications that the story of Sawney Bean is probably not true. So let's talk about some elements of the story that have had holes poked in them over the years. The Beans were supposedly housed in Edinburgh's toll booth, but at the time it wasn't in very good condition and probably couldn't house prisoners, especially almost 50 of them. Another source noted that the cave supposedly used as the Beans' residence was way too small to accommodate a family of that size. Another thing I thought of is that the Beans were executed in Edinburgh. Remember, Sawney was originally from Edinburgh, but the family lived in South Ayrshire on the opposite side of the country. Why would they go all the way back to Edinburgh if his crimes weren't even committed there? And could they have even made it there in the span of a day? Another thing, and something we'll get into a bit more later, is timing. 
Sawney Bean supposedly lived in the 1600s, but the story didn't start appearing in print until at least 100 years later. Why did it take so long for it to be written down? But the most notable thing here is that there's no historical evidence of anything like this happening. There's no record of the family's arrest or execution, and there aren't any records of large numbers of innkeepers or travelers being executed at this time either. It's also believed that King James never would have let a story like this be forgotten if he'd taken part in it. So let's talk about some theories. The first thing I wanted to mention was something I found in the comments section of an article. The person said the story may have been made up by Protestants as anti-Catholic propaganda. The Jacobite Rebellion of 1745 and 1746 was sparked by supporters of James II, the grandson of the aforementioned James I. James II took over the throne in 1685, but he was Catholic, and the English, who were mostly Protestant, didn't want a Catholic on the throne. He was overthrown, but claimed to be king for the rest of his life. His supporters came to be known as Jacobites. The descendants of James II weren't too happy about losing their claim to the throne. In 1745, his grandson Charles sailed to Edinburgh and was declared King James VIII of Scotland by the Jacobites. Obviously, this was not too well received. Charles was driven out of the city and eventually returned to France, where James II had been exiled. Charles died in 1788. I didn't find much else about this anti-Catholic theory, and I'm sure you could poke all sorts of holes in it. But there was obviously religious tension in the area at the time, and I thought it was worth bringing up. The next theory is that the story was made up, or at least largely exaggerated, for monetary purposes. In the book, The Legend of Sawney Bean, published in 1975, author Ronald Holmes says stories with lots of gore sold pretty well at the time. According to Scottish historian Dr. Louise Yeoman, it sounds like the plot for a box office topping horror film, and that's because it was invented to serve a very similar purpose, to sell books. On a similar note, some people think the story was inspired by another Scottish cannibal named Andrew Christie, better known as Christie Cleek. Cleek was a butcher in Perth, Scotland, not Australia, and was said to have engaged in survival cannibalism during a famine. He took up with a group of cannibals that was eventually raided by a small army, but he managed to escape. Not much else is known about him after this. But the last and most prominent theory is that the story was made up by someone from England as a form of anti-Scottish propaganda. Like I said earlier, the story of Sawney Bean started appearing in print in the 1700s, though the exact time and place isn't really clear. Some sources said 1701, but others said it was as late as 1775. Some say it first started appearing in newspapers, and others said it actually appeared in broadsheets, which are similar to modern-day pamphlets. I also mentioned that the story takes place in the 1600s, 100 years before it was actually written down, and a lot of people think it's strange that it took this long. In 1707, the Treaty of Union brought England and Scotland together to form the United Kingdom, which of course also consists of Wales and Northern Ireland. But despite this, there was still a lot of tension between England and Scotland at the time. According to Dr. Yeoman, the Sawney story was a dig at Scots, a people so barbarous they could produce a monster like Sawney, who lived in a cave and ate people. Sawney's wife, Agnes Douglas, or Black Agnes, is also similar to Agnes Randolph, the Countess of Dunbar and March in 1300 Scotland. She was sometimes called Black Agnes due to her dark complexion. Agnes once defended her castle against an English siege and was seen as a hero in her native Scotland. This could have been an intentional attempt by whoever made up the story to defame someone who was seen as a hero to the Scottish. And James I, the hero of the Sawney Bean story, probably wasn't very well liked by the Scottish either. According to an article on Brooklyn College's website, since James was the first Scottish king on the English throne and viewed as having opened the floodgates for unwanted Scots of any variety, attributing it to his reign makes a bit of sense. 
And then there was the name Sony itself. It was apparently a nickname for Alexander, but also a generic Scottish name, often used in a derogatory way, sort of the equivalent of calling a cartoon Irishman Patty. If the story really was written as anti-Scottish propaganda, there's no telling who was responsible for it. There has been speculation that it was written by Daniel Defoe, most famously known for his novel Robinson Crusoe, published in 1719. But of course, there's no confirmation of this. Needless to say, real or not, and it's probably not, the Sawney Bean legend continues to fascinate people today. There are dozens upon dozens of books and movies thought to be inspired by it. Most famously, it served as at least partial inspiration for Wes Craven's 1977 movie, The Hills Have Eyes. According to an article on Bloody Disgusting, the filmmaker was struck by the parallel between the cave-dwelling cannibals and the animalistic revenge meted out by more civilized people. I've also read that the legend inspired Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but I'm not sure about that. I already talked about that movie in another video, which I will post somewhere up in the cards and probably at the end of this video or in the description if you want to check it out. So that's all I have for you today on The Legend of Sawney Bean. The story is apparently pretty popular in Scotland, so if you are Scottish, I would love to know what version you've heard. And of course, even if you're not Scottish, I would love to know your thoughts down below. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting that bell. Thanks for watching and have a creepy day. Bye guys.